We attach ourselves to people that make us feel warm and welcomed. It helps build community and it helps our survival. If you have untreated trauma, it affects you on a DNA level. You can pass that onto your kids. So it's well worth getting your trauma sorted out. And I do my best to see that silver lining within every experience. The solution should be simple, but it's not because we're talking about culture change, talking about changing behaviours, we're talking about challenging identities. Mr. Hari, thanks for coming on the show. Hooray. So good to be back with you, Tom. I wish we were still on a fucking bed in Melbourne, but <laughs> so people are going to misunderstand that way. <laughs> Uh, so true. We did an interview that was on a bed. I'm not alluding to previous yeah. election encounters, right? Just to be clear, That's sadly, right. I'm not alluding to that. But, yeah. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Exactly. No, we, um, but I would kill to be in Melbourne at oh, the moment. To believe it or not, the no. weather's actually been pretty good. We're we're pretty uh, pretty lucky with the weather. Don't fucking the torture me. You know, I'm in London, right? I've spent the pandemic alternately in London and Las Vegas, and. Uh, both of which were weird places to spend the pandemic, but Vegas particularly, especially because apart from the first three weeks, Vegas never shut down. Yeah. So, because I'm, as you know, I'm writing a book about something that's happening in Vegas. And um, Vegas was particularly, Vegas is weird at the best of times, but during the pandemic, it was full of people whose response to a global pandemic is to say, well, this is the perfect time to go to Vegas. So <laughs> it was just full of the most insane people. They were quite fun, yeah. but definitely insane. So God, yeah. yeah, I would kill to be in Melbourne, but uh, sadly it cannot be. No, well, is it now? Is it snowing in your area? It's almost snowing. Almost yeah, snowing. yeah. It's wow. almost snowing. It's funny, actually, I was thinking about Melbourne at the start of the pandemic because I got contacted by someone I hadn't seen since I was 16 on, um, on Facebook, they messaged me and, and she said, um, oh, yeah, and I just want to check that you're okay. And I was like, oh, that's very nice. But uh, why me <laughs> in particular? And she said, I don't know if you remember, she said, but when we were 16, we watched a film together about the end of the world, some apocalyptic film. I think it might have been Waterworld, actually, the terrible oh, yeah. And she said, we all talked after we watched the film about... Um, the point in the collapse of civilization where we would all kill ourselves. And she said, I suddenly remembered that you said it's when they stop filming neighbors and coronation street and they shut down all the branches of KFC and McDonald's. Uh, <laughs> and she said, and suddenly I realized that has actually happened. Oh my so I wanted God. to make sure you were, I was like, Oh my God, the t what I pictured as the literal apocalypse when I was 16 years old has come to pass. Right. Yeah. So anyway, that's why Melbourne came into my head because obviously, um, Melbourne is the site of the, the the religious and holy site where Neighbours is filmed. So. Yes. I, yeah, that's actually terrifying, though, because that actually did come to pass. You know, everything shut down. Yeah. And, <laughs> God, yeah. I mean, who would have thought, honestly, you know, even just before we get into it all, like, who would have thought that we'd, we'd be talking about, you know, you know, we'd be saying terms like social distancing, lockdown, you know, all, all these kinds of things. It's just, it's, it's just so interesting how dramatically the world can change just like that. You know, it obviously sounds cliche, mm -hmm. but it, it never ceases to amaze me. Yeah, no, it's, it's really, yeah, it, 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 it's a complete, there's this um, British writer, JG Ballard, who grew up in the, um, what was called the International Concession in Shanghai. So it was basically the bit where when the Britain, British invaded, they just sort of seized an area of land and said, well, this is ours now. Nice. And uh, the French did the same and other, other European powers did the same. And when he was a kid, um, basically during the war, basically the entire international concession was just torn down. So this whole world he had known just vanished. And he said for the rest of his life, he was always left with this feeling that the entire world was a stage set and could just be ripped down at any moment, yeah. right? And uh, he, people, um, some people will have seen the film about his memoir of that, which is called Empire of the Sun, or in, in fact, read the book, which is amazing. Um, but yeah, and I think it gives you, there are these moments in life where you suddenly get this feeling like everything is a stage set and you realize how arbitrary the world in which we live is and how radically it can change. For, yeah. for bad, to be sure, but also for good, right? Yes. The, so it's this... Um, yeah, I've been thinking about that a lot. Ballard and yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, look, I mean, that that is actually a really brilliant segue into getting into, I suppose, a lot of the points we're going to discuss because, especially that for good component, because there are so many examples of the way that we live in our society that is just essentially a construct. You know, we're not talking about everything being a construct, but there are lots of ways that 
you know, it only takes a few people, you know, or, or, and then you know, more people to kind of band together and go, hang on, is this the only way that we need to be doing this? You know, and, you know, in, in lost connections, you pointed out the whole chemical imbalance theory and really went into the depths of that. And I think credit, credit to you, mate, I think one of the greatest things about your work is that you'll often read books where people have a theory and then due to the fact of being human, you know, they try to, whether unconsciously or unconsciously, kind of confirm their own bias as they go along. But, you know, as any good journalist does, and obviously I put you in that category, you actually don't know the answers that you're trying to figure out here. So, and you can tell, you can just tell, because as you read your books, you're going through the motions, you're saying, you know, when, you know, when this professor said this to me, you know, that, that, that didn't really sit right. So I kind of wanted to figure out why that really didn't sit right and all that kind of thing. But, um, you know, I suppose, you know, long, long story short, let us, um, let us kind of explore the the latest book that you've got coming out, mate. Do you want to give you us know, a bit that's of a interesting that You said that because uh, for me, because I spend so long researching my books and I go to so many different places, for me, if I knew the answers all in advance, I just think it would be too boring. I couldn't yeah. do it, right? So for me, I always start with a question that I want to understand. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, as you know, with my previous books, we had a lot of addiction in my family. So I wanted to understand addiction and the war on drugs. With uh, one of my other books, I wanted to understand why depression and anxiety have gone up so much. And, and for this latest book, Stolen Focus, I really wanted to think about why so many of us seem to be struggling to focus and pay attention, right? There's a, for example, there's a small study of college students in the United States that found that they are now focus on average for 65 seconds on any task, 65 seconds. A, a different study by Professor Gloria Mark at the University of California, Irvine, found that the average office worker now focuses for just three minutes on any one task. You know, um, and this goes right up the chain. Even CEOs on average only have 29 minutes a day where they focus uninterruptedly on one thing. So it seemed to me like almost like a kind of itching powder had been poured over our civilization. I felt like yeah. I could see it everywhere I looked. But I also thought, you know... Lots of people, when they get older, their attention gets, their attention degenerates, very easy to mistake your own deterioration for the deterioration of the world. You know, you can find, you know, scripts where monks nearly a thousand years ago were worrying about their own attention problems. I thought, is this a real problem? If it is, why is it happening? What's really going on here? Um, So that's the kind of the mystery I wanted to get at, is this happening? If it is, why? And what can we do about it? Mm. And as I, obviously, as you know, I traveled all over the world from Rio to Auckland, uh, from Miami to Montreal, trying to find the the, the answers to this. Um, I really came to think that we have profoundly misunderstood what's going on mm. and that we need to think very differently about this problem. And when we do, it opens up a very different set of solutions uh, that, that can help us get our minds back. I mean, the, the, the most interesting thing for me was that, um, you know, this began over 100 years ago. You know, we, we just think of social media and big tech being the rise of, you know, sealing our focus and, and um, technology in general. But um, one of the things I really loved, um, and I suppose we could begin there, um, you know, from a chronological standpoint, is that this idea about economic growth? And no, I certainly didn't. I can't imagine anyone else would put kind of two and two together thinking, you know, if you're always thinking about growing, well, yes, it definitely makes sense that, you know, in that kind of capitalistic system, how can we keep consuming and consuming and consuming? So do you want to just speak a, a little bit about that? Because did that stump you as well? Yeah, that came to me very late in in the the research for the book. And I think it's partly about realizing that this is happening to all of us, right? That whenever I had a problem with my own attention and pretty much everyone I know who has problems with their attention, the first instinct is to blame yourself, right? Mm. To go, oh, I'm being weak, I'm being lazy, I'm not good enough, there's something wrong with me. Uh, or when, when our kids can't focus, we sort of pathologize their behavior, there's something wrong with my child. And what I learned from interviewing these experts all over the world is in fact, this is happening to almost all of us and it's happening for big systemic reasons. So one of the leading experts in the world on children's attention problems, a man named Professor Joel Nigg, who's in Portland and Oregon where I interviewed him, said to me that we need to ask if in fact we're, we're having, we've developed what he called an attentional pathogenic culture, which means we've, we've developed a culture where it's very hard for all of us to focus and pay attention. And with each year that passes, 
paying deep forms of attention, like reading a book, become more and more like running up a down escalator. You know, some people can still get to the top of the escalator yeah. if it's going down, but it's getting harder and harder for us. Um, and, and there's actually 12 deep reasons, 12 deep causes uh, why this is happening. Um, but there's something that sort of underlies them, a lot of them, not all of them, which, which you're getting at. So you've gone to uh, the deepest layer, Tom, right? Which <laughs> right. is, and I think you have to sort of explain a few steps that led me to get there. Mm-hmm. Um, so early in the process, when I was still trying to figure out, is this actually happening, right? Or is it just a kind of anecdotal feeling that we all have? Um, I went to Copenhagen in Denmark uh, to interview the, uh, an amazing man named Professor Suna Lehman. He's a professor of applied mathematics at the um, Technical University of Denmark. And he did, with a lot of other people, a study that is the first study that proved this is a real problem. Our collective attention really is degenerating and degenerating quite rapidly, actually. Um, and and if you look at his study, you start to grip glass, grasp some of the underlying reasons for what's going on. So the way he did it, Suna had this, Suna started studying this because he had a personal um, concern. He had two sons. Every morning, his little sons would come and they'd jump into his bed. And Suna loves his sons. But absolutely instinctively, every morning, he wouldn't reach for them. He would reach for the side of the bed and look at his phone first. And he thought, oh, there's something not right here, right? There's something not right about the fact that I'm doing that. And, and, and he was struggling to pay attention. So he just, he's decided to start doing some research into this. It was actually the time of the 2016 presidential election in the United States when we were all so obsessed by the meteor that was about to hit us all. And, um, you know, and... and and, and so he decides to do this research with part of big teams like Professor Philip Stein in, in, in Berlin, sorry, um, so, who I also interviewed. So what they did, first they started looking at something really simple, right? They're trying to figure out, okay, let's think about Twitter. As you know, on Twitter, some top, topics trend. That means lots of people are talking about them. So first they just did a really simple thing. They looked at, in 2013... If a topic trended on Twitter, how long did it trend for? So if something is everyone's talking about it, how long did everyone or huge numbers of people focus on it? And the average amount of time a topic trended in 2013 was 17.5 hours, right? Mm. Within just a few years that had gone down, a couple of years that had gone down to just 12 hours, right? So so, oh, that looks like the thing that we're all talking about, or lots of people are talking about, is holding our attention for less time. Yeah. But that's, you know, maybe this is just a quirk of Twitter, you know, who knows? They started looking at other websites like Reddit, other social media sites, a whole range of websites. And they discovered the exact same trend. Um, the longer the site exists, the less and less time anyone talks about one particular thing, right? Mm-hmm. So the collective attention on one thing, whatever it might be that day, is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. Then they looked at a whole range of other things like how long... When a movie is a hit, how long do people keep going to see it? Uh, when a book is successful, how long do people people keep going to see that? And they discovered the same shrinking trend. But what was weird was when they kept going back in time, so they would then go back, well, let's look at the 1950s. They discovered the same trend. So people focus more on one thing in the 50s than in the 60s. People focus more on one thing in the 60s than the 70s. It was the same graph for almost everything they looked at. There were a handful mm-hmm. of exceptions. Um, Wikipedia was one of the very few exceptions, but for most things, uh, they were looking at Google searches. You can measure it that way, the same trend. They were like, well, this is weird. What's, what's going on here? How far back does this go? Then they discover this really clever technique. Uh, it's slightly fancy, but it's it, the fancy term for it is detecting n-grams. Basically, you can scan, because of Google Books, books going back, you know, centuries are now scanned. So what you can do is you can scan a book, you can train an algorithm to scan a book, and detect when a new phrase appears, say, let's say no deal Brexit. No one had ever said the phrase no deal Brexit before, you know, whatever, um, 20, 2016. Yeah. Uh, and then they said it a lot. And I'm guessing in 10 years time, very few people will be saying no deal Brexit anymore, yeah. right? So you can detect a phrase that suddenly appears and suddenly disappears. Uh, and you can detect, oh, how long do people talk about a new phrase? Like, I don't know, the Harlem Renaissance in the 1920s. That's a phrase that would be used a lot. No one used it before. People don't use it now. They want to figure out, the phrase for this is detecting n-grams. So it means you can detect how long a new topic emerges and how long we talk about it. It's effectively like figuring out, well, what trended on Twitter 
in the past, yeah, right? Which so is a cool. crazy thing to think about. Yeah. And what was crazy was they went back, they started scanning, they looked at books going back to the 1880s. Every single decade since the 1880s, the same trend was going on, right? People were talking less and less about any one topic with each decade that passes. So collectively, we were focusing on one thing less and less. The, Mm. The world really is speeding up. As Suna put it when he studied that, when he saw that graph, he was like, God damn it this is real, right? Something's happening here. And he was trying to figure out, well, so uh, this is crucial for us thinking about our own attention problems for lots of reasons. But one is this shows this goes much deeper than, you know, your individual failing, my individual failing, or just one new invention like the smartphone. Now the smartphone certainly supercharged it. And in particular, some aspects of how the smartphone works supercharged it. But this is, this is a much deeper problem that goes much further back. And Suna was trying to figure out, well, what's what's going on here? And there's lots of things, obviously, but one is um, speed. So we could, human beings can only process a certain amount of information. And what they discovered, they want to figure out how could you, a bit like the way that climate scientists build climate models to figure out what the weather's going to be, which worked very well and predict that Australia is going to burn down, but we won't yep. talk about that. It's a bit depressing. <laughs> uh, but the, um, don't, don't be anxious. Okay. Um, the, the, a bit like climate models. They tried, they built a model, an sort of informational climate model to try to figure out, well, what do you, can you do to information to make it behave like this graph? And what they discovered was the more information you put in, the faster things get, and the, and the worse your attention gets. Basically, human beings can only focus at a certain level of speed. Hmm. You can make us go faster, but if you do, we become shallower. You can look at studies of speed reading, right? Um, so obviously, you think about speed reading, right? Um, human beings can be trained to speed read. You can do it, right? And some people can do it really well. But even the people who do it really well, they always find the same thing. The faster you go, the less you understand, the less you comprehend, the less you retain, right? So I could train you. I mean, I couldn't, but someone could train you mm-hmm. uh, to, you know, to to skim a book in two hours, right? And you would you'd get something out of it after the training, but you would not be able to retain the information, remember it, process it, understand it. The faster you go, you get uh, what's called uh, decreased comprehension, right? Uh, and decreased depth of processing is the kind of technical phrase, right? So what Suna discovered is. Um, the more information you flood in, the faster the world appears to go, the less you'll be able to focus, right? Uh, and there's lots of implications for this about the way we live and lots of solutions to that that we can talk about. There's a, an amazing man named Professor Guy Claxton, who's a professor of learning sciences at the University of Winchester here in Britain, who has really sh- studied lots of slow practices. Mm. Like I even said that in a slow voice. Didn't I? Yeah, slow. it came across. Uh, <laughs> so it wasn't deliberate. Uh, yeah. Like yoga, Tai Chi, meditation. And he discovered the key reason why those improve our attention and they really do improve our attention is precisely because they are slow practices. They slow you down mm. and they slow you down in the rest of your life. And the more you can slow down, the better you can, the better you can focus. So this is a long way of getting to your original question about economic growth. But one, the big deep question we have to ask is why is the world speeding up so much? Right. So there's evidence that we talk faster than we did in the past mm-hmm. by a significant amount. We walk faster than we did in the past. We walk faster even than we did when I was a child. Um, there's been significant increases in all forms of speed. There's a limit to how much we can absorb that. It comes yeah. with a cost, right? One of the costs is we can focus and pay attention significantly less. Um, Suna gave me the, Professor Lehman gave me the analogy that it's like we're being sprayed with a fire hose, right? And so why is it speeding up so much? And there's lots of theories about this. And this is only one theory and people will disagree about this. But um, there's a, a professor in Norway, Professor Thomas Hilland Eriksson, who is an amazing man. He's like one of the leading social scientists. And he argued to me, I think quite persuasively, and lots of other people did as well, that part of what's going on is we live in an economic system that is built around going faster and faster every year, right? Because the economy has to grow. How do we judge? How are you going to judge Scott Morrison? How uh, how is Boris Johnson going to be judged? Yeah. How, how are politicians judged? Generally, did the economy grow, right? If the economy doesn't grow, they're 
And same with CEOs of businesses. Did your business grow this year? If it did, they're rewarded. If it shrunk, they're, they're generally punished or chucked out. Mm. Um, so we live in a system that requires growth. How do you get growth? You can do one of two things. You can either discover a new market, which is sometimes happens, or you can get you can cram more into the existing market. So for example, if I can get you when you watch television to also look at your phone while you're watching the TV, right? I've doubled the market for mm -hmm. advertising, right? Because you're going to see the ad on the TV and you're going to see the ad on your phone, right? Now that is a classic example of economic growth. I've doubled the market by getting you to do more. Mm -hmm. If I can get you to sleep less and sleep is absolutely essential for attention, I'm sure we'll talk about that. The science mm -hmm. around that is really interesting. If I can get you to sleep less, um, I've grown the market, right? If you sleep eight hours a night, well, okay. If you sleep six hours a night, I've two more hours in which you can look at advertising, in which you can buy shit, right? Yes. Um, so there's all sorts of things like that. So I think at some point, and that's the most big and most daunting of all the causes, because it seems so ingrained in our way of life, there are actually alternatives we can really good alternatives we can talk about if you like and we're going to have to deal with this because of global warming anyway mm. you, you, you can't have infinite growth on a finite planet but the the um i think that's the the biggest there's lots of there's a million steps before we get to that but but that i think is one of the causes we're sooner or later going to have to deal with because it, it, human deep human attention is not compatible with an ever accelerating world. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's so true, you know, and um, you know, I think, okay. So before I get too excited and just <laughs> dive into some quick, <laughs> now I have to tell you, I never ever prepare for interviews, but honestly, as I was reading the book, it's just the questions, you know, I really wanted to ask them. So I actually did prepare for this one, mate. But oh, um, I didn't prepare for our last one. I just came into your room and we started <laughs> drinking a beer. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was fun. That was fun. <laughs> um, but so, so what I what I think I'd really love to do is because a lot of people who listen to the show, um, you know, we get a lot of people that come on and talk about disorders and things, and we, you know, we do some awareness for mental health and, um, you know, being a counselor, we do a lot of a lot of stuff around emotional well being. I think one of the most important things that you discuss in this book is this idea around cruel optimism. And I think it's, if we talk about it now, it's going to perfectly um, set the stage for what we're really talking about here in terms of systemic issues, you know, and big things that, you know, just saying, Oh, you know, oh, so you should just probably meditate more or you should take some more, you know, Ritalin for your attention issues is, 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 is cruel. So I'd, I'd love for you to just set the stage with, with um, that idea. Yeah, and it's important to say it's not that meditation is cruel. Meditation is a really useful tool. I know you're, I'm just clarifying because I know you think this. Uh, and it's not that Ritalin is always wrong. It's not. It, this is about, about a different way of thinking. So yeah. um concept of cruel optimism was invented by a, a man who sadly just died, actually, called Lauren Berlan. He was a historian, mm -hmm. American historian. And so cruel optimism is where you take something that's got really big causes in the society and in the way we live, like obesity, depression, attention problems. And you say to someone, great news. I've got a solution to your obesity, depression, attention problems. You just need to do two little quick steps. You just do one thing, just integrate it into your life and it's all going to go away. Right. And of course, cruel optimism sounds like optimism. It sounds like a kindness, right? You're saying you've got this problem. We can solve it. Mm. Right. Um, but actually the cruelty is because the solution it offers is so superficial because it usually doesn't deal with the deep underlying causes of the problem. It sets the individual up to fail and it sets them up to fail in a particular way because because you've in this glowing way said, I've got the solution for you. When that solution fails, the individual generally blames themselves, mm. right? They generally say, but, but I did the thing you're meant to do and I'm still obese or depressed or can't focus there must be something really wrong with me, right? Now, the alternative to cruel optimism is not pessimism, it's authentic optimism, which is where you actually explain to people what the real causes of the problem are, and together we build solutions to those deep underlying problems. But a good example of cruel optimism um, it, is a great guy called Ronald Purser, who's a professor of management studies at San Francisco University, who, who, who has done really good work on this. Um, a good example would be for, uh, so there's a, I'm not going to name the book because I don't want to slag off specific individuals, but there's a, a very well-selling, uh, hugely best-selling book that says stress is just in your mind, right? Uh, stress is just a state of mind. 
All you need to do is learn to meditate. Actually, it was a study at Stanford that found the 10 biggest causes of stress. They're things like your boss being a prick, uh, no, you know, not having health insurance, um, you know, um, fear of layoffs, lack of control over your work. None of those things. If you don't have health insurance, that's not in your fucking mind, right? If you don't have any money in the bank, that's in your bank account or not in your bank account. That's yeah. not in your mind, right? And there's a kind of, a, an, a, um, Ronald talks about a company that was simultaneously throwing people off healthcare, but offering meditation classes to them, right? And and we're like praised by loads of journalists. Oh, isn't this wonderful? They offer these meditation classes. And, and to me, that's almost like the equivalent of Marie Antoinette saying about starving French people, let them eat cake. It's almost mm. like let them be present, right? Mm. Which is not to say meditation does not have huge value. Meditation has huge value. And we can talk about that um, as a slow practice and for other reasons. But, but I think one of the problems we've had with attention is we've got this really big crisis with 12 deep underlying causes that I write about in Stolen Focus. What we've done is we've talked about it in a ludicrously simplistic way. We just say, oh, if you just look at your phone and see how many hours a day you, you know, the screen time option on the iPhone, you'll be fine. You know, this is really easy. You just need these few little tweaks and you'll be better. Now there's some value in those tweaks. I'm Mm -hmm. in favor of all of them, but but that's not going to solve the problem, right? And, and so we need to overcome cruel optimism, which, which says to people, oh, this is just a really simple problem. And I've got a really simple little answer for you. And we're all going to be fine. Now that, of course, and I feel that as well. We want to hear those messages because yep. who wants to be told? Fuck, this is a really big issue that's affecting everyone in the world, right? I get it. At first, that's a bummer. <laughs> it's much more pleasing to be told initially, oh, just do 10 minutes on this app, you'll get the, you know, you'll, it'll all be magic. Um, but the truth is at some level, we know that's not the answer. And indeed the science shows that's not the answer, Mm. but there's a power in genuinely understanding what's happening to us. And once you genuinely understand it, there are certainly individual things you can do that will improve things to some degree. I'm in favor of them. I'm also in favor of being honest with people that it will, will require another level, uh, of, of collective political action that we can do together. Mm. You know, it's not just that your focus collapsed. It's not that your focus collapsed. It's that your focus has been stolen. And what we need to do is take on the force. That's why the book is called Stolen Focus. And we, what we need to do is together take on those forces that have stolen our focus. I mean, I, I just, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I think when you look at macroeconomics as a whole and, and what's going on, you know, it's just so interesting that the self-development industry is booming and booming. And why would that be happening other than the fact that there's a continuing a need for it, a need for it. More people are going, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? You know, and it's set up in a system that's, you know, with, with tech and all this stuff and, you know, you've written about BF Skinner, who we ironically studied <laughs> last trimester. So <laughs> that was lots of fun. Um, you know, but it's just attacking that that kind of lower brain area or what Tristan was was, ta- was talking about. Um, but it's it, it's it's so true. And you know, it does hit home for me personally because um being a counselor, one one question that um keeps coming up with a lot of clients is you can see the shame around the way they, they frame this and they, they say, Oh, I just, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I, I can't find my purpose, you know, all this kind of thing. And there's, there's so much emotional weight and baggage. And you see as though it's like them saying, I'm really dumb and stupid because I can't find what I, what it is that I'm supposed to be doing. And, and, and you know, we live in this world now where this wants your attention, this wants your attention, this one should, it's so hard, you know, to just sit away for 10 minutes, let alone, really having a deep existential think about your life and thinking, okay, what's my next step? And I think the way you spoke about cruel optimism was just, I could almost hear, hear people just going, oh, you know, and they're not just saying, well, it's not entirely. I mean, there are some things that we all as individuals can do, but we are now mm-hmm. living in a system that is really designed to grab and take away the that ability for us to think, you know? I think you're totally right. And I think we throw everything back onto the individual, Mm. right? And I I don't exempt myself from that. You know, when I was trying to deal with these tension problems, the drastic thing I did, as you know, from the book is I went and spent three months totally without the internet, right? Or or a smartphone. Um, 
But when I, I remember I had a real epiphany about this because it helped me a lot when I was there. We were ups and downs, but it helped me a lot when I was in Provincetown, a place in Cape Cod, and I was trying to do that. But as soon as I came back to the environment in which we all live, I went pretty much back to where I'd been before. Not quite as bad, but pretty much. And I remember going to interview this Google engineer, former Google engineer in Moscow, an amazing guy called Dr. James Williams. And him saying to me, well, what you've tried to do, this individual personal solution, that's not the solution in any more than the solution to air pollution is for you to put on a gas mask one day a week, Mm -hmm. right? Okay, put on a gas mask if you want. It might give you a bit of relief, but that's not the solution to air pollution, right? Solution to air pollution is we need to go to the sources of the pollution and we need to stop it, Mm -hmm. right? And it's really important for people to understand. It, I don't think that sometimes this is falsely framed as, oh, there's things you can do or there's collective solutions. There's this collective solutions just appear from heaven, right? That's not how it works. Think about um, your grandmothers and my grandmothers, right? So when my gra- I'm 42. When my grandmothers were 42 years old, it was 1962. In 1962, um, there were... Four percent. They were my grandparents. One of my grandmothers was in Scotland, and one was on a mountain in Switzerland. So, working class woman in Scotland, poor rural woman in Switzerland. Uh, my grandmothers had had unbelievably hard lives. My Scottish grandmother left school when she was thirteen to go and work in a laundry. Uh, my Swiss grandmother, um, and by the way, my Scottish grandmother's brother went carried on going to school, but no one gave a shit about girls going to school. Um, my Scottish grandmother, my Swiss grandmother, you know, she wanted to be an artist. She was told girls, she was amazing at drawing. She was like, girls can't be artists. Don't be so stupid. She was told to shut up and just get married. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so by 1962, 4% of, um, of members of parliament in Britain were women. Um, women were not allowed to vote in the part of Switzerland where my grandmother lived. It was legal for their husbands to rape them. There were no domestic violence shelters in the whole world. Um, women were not allowed to have bank accounts in their own name once they got married. Mm. Uh, and my grandmother wasn't allowed to get a job outside the home without the written permission of her husband, right? So you just think the scale of the challenge. And men controlled every single institution of power in the whole world, mm. right? Um, now, we've, there's still obviously a lot to do. And I know it's annoying for a man to mansplain this. I apologize to all women listening. Um, But if I think about the life of my niece, who also loves to draw, and compare it to the life of my grandmother, Mm -hmm. um, there's been a staggering transformation. If someone Mm -hmm. said that it should be legal for my niece to be raped by her husband, or that she shouldn't be allowed to have a bank account, or she should have to leave school when she's 13... I mean, it would be unthinkable. Even crazy, far out misogynists don't say that, right? Mm, mm. Um, how did that change happen? It did not happen because someone at the top said, "Oh, let's be nice to women," right? What happened? It happened because ordinary women banded together and and some sympathetic men, and said, "We're not fucking taking this anymore," right? And banded together and fought and fought and fought, and it was a hard slog at every stage to reclaim their rights to their bodies, their lives. And it, so, and every change, you know, Australia it, it was one of the first countries where workers banded together and fought for their rights in incredible ways. It's one of the reasons why Australia has one of the biggest middle classes in the world, why it's such a civilized country, because workers did that fight. And it still has to be renewed every generation, of course, but um, the, the, all these changes. So sometimes it's framed as, oh, there's these things you can do as an individual, or there's the political changes, the bigger stuff. It's not true, right? There is the stuff you can do as an isolated individual, and I talk a lot about that in the book. I'm in favor of that. But there is also stuff you as an individual do by banding together with other individuals and fighting for something better, right? Mm. To take on the forces that are fucking with your head. And just like we had, you know, we and still have and still need a feminist movement for women to assert their right to their own bodies, I think we need a sort of attention movement mm. to assert our right to our own minds. And again, that requires a shift in our psychology, right? We are not the flawed people, broken people, right? And we're not medieval peasants begging at the court of King Zuckerberg for a few little crumbs of attention from his table, right? We are the free citizens of democracies. We own our own minds and we need to take them back from the forces that have stolen them. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, um, it is a bit, it's uh, 
it's interesting because even, you know, even talking on a podcast and, you know, reading a book, I mean, I haven't read any studies, but I'm sure people are reading less books in this day and age. And maybe you could argue that people are listening to more books or whatever it is, but you know, the thought process is involved. I'm not trying to be too pessimistic. Cause I'm actually inherently an optimist, <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, you know, even, even the thought processes involved um, requires deep thinking, you know, is that kind of a problem that you, that, that came into your mind at some point when you, you were thinking through some of these solutions? Yeah, the danger is that it, this is why we need to do this urgently because it can be a bit like when you put on so much weight that it becomes harder and harder to exercise, mm. right? The danger is as our attention degrades, it becomes harder and harder to take on the forces that are invading our attention, right? Suna Lehman, the Danish professor, just before um, I met him, he'd been looking at this picture and it was an image of Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, uh, so it was an audience that were entirely wearing VR headsets, the what they call the metaverse, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the so wearing he- VR headsets, and Mark Zuckerberg was the only person not wearing a VR headset standing in front of them, beaming, right? And Suna Lehman is like, this is like a dystopian image of the future where we're all kind of invaded and manipulated, and you've got this tiny elite who do their meditation workshops. So, you know, yeah, one of the ironies is, as someone said to me, I think it was. Ezra Raskin, a, a Silicon Valley designer and dissident, said to me, one of the ironies is, you know, they do all these, you know, these places like Facebook are full of meditation workshops, but they are the biggest perpetrators of non-mindfulness of in the whole world. And we can talk about the ways in which, if you like, the ways in which um, the current functioning of social media is absolutely invading our ability to focus and pay attention and trashing it. So I think you're right. We, we, we've got to act on these things quickly because the longer we wait, the harder it gets because mm. of the 12 trends that I write about in stolen focus that are ruining our attention. You know, a lot of them are uh, accelerating. A lot of them are accelerating. Some of them are accelerating quite sharply. Can I give you an example? Please. Um, yeah. So uh, one of the people I learned most from for the book was an uh, amazing man named Professor Earl Miller. He's at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's one of the leading neuroscientists in the world. Um, I went to go and see him at MIT, and he said, got to understand one key fact. You can only really think about one consciously, consciously think about one thing at a time, right? That's it. You can think about one thing at a time. I'm talking to you. I can't think about what am I going to have for lunch, right? Yeah. Can't do it, right? If I start thinking about that, I've lost my ability to think about you. I have to switch back, right? Um, and he said, that's just the fundamental structure of the human brain, which has not changed in 40,000 years. We're not going to get away from that, right? But what's happened is, as the world has sped up and accelerated, we have convinced ourselves we can do more than one thing at a time. So we took a phrase that comes from computing, multitasking, right? Which is a term that was invented for computers. Computers can multitask. They've got more than one processor. So they can do more than one thing at the same time. Mm. We took that term and we applied it to ourselves. But he said, this is an enormous delusion. it's It's a fundamental mistake. So it used to be thought by scientists that you could multitask, right? That you can do more than one thing at a time. It feels intuitive, right? You're like, oh yeah, I've, I've done that. I've I've had experiences where we've done that. But what happens when you get people in labs and you say, okay, do these two things at the same time, and they study them, they discover in fact what happens is four, four things happen to you that profoundly degrade your ability to think and pay attention. The first is what's called a, the switch cost effect, right? So say, I, say while I was talking to you, I was, I'm not, don't worry, but say I was glancing at my text messages, right? If I, if I look at you, I glance at my text, you can, you can imagine I could go, oh, text a second, glance at your text message, right? If I glance at my text message and look back at you, what happens is my brain has to reconfigure in that moment, right? What was what was I talking to Tom about again? Where was I then? Yeah. Right? And that is a significant cost in terms of your mental bandwidth, right? So that's the first cost. The second cost is error backtracking. So let's say I do that. Let's say, let's say I'm doing my tax return and I check my texts, right? In the moment in which I go back to my tax return, because my attention has gone off to something else, because a certain amount of my bandwidth has gone somewhere else, um, I start to make mistakes. And then I have to go back and correct those mistakes. So that's another cost, right? Correcting errors. The, the third cost is, is actually to your, to your memory. You, um, you, you, to encode things in your memory takes time, right? 
um, and it takes mental energy. And if that energy is spent switching, you just remember less. And the fourth cost is a medium to longer term cost, which is to your creativity. So creativity happens where one of the ways creativity happens is, um, you know, you put together two ideas that have never been put together before, right? Um, you combine ideas in new and interesting ways. And when your brain is freed up, it, when you're mind wandering or you're just thinking, your brain will just run over the things you know, and it will start making connections in interesting ways, right? Um, if your mind is just jammed up, we're constantly switching between tasks. What was I just watching on television? What does this text message say? What am I saying to Tom? What's this other person texting me saying? Oh, what's that message on WhatsApp? What's this thing on Snapchat here? What If you're jammed up with that constant switching, you become significantly less creative over time. Mm-hmm. And there are studies that show this is a, a really significant effect. There was a small study that was done by Hewlett Packard, you know, the people who make printers. Mm-hmm. It was a really simple experiment. Um, they just got people, they split the workers into two. First group was told, just get on with your job with no distractions. And the second group was told, um, you were going to phone you and you're going to get text messages. Right? And they wanted to figure out the difference in their performance and their IQ. What was incredible was the people who were just receiving phone calls and text messages, and not like a hugely no. unusual thing in our society, were 10, scored 10 IQ points lower than the people who were not disrupted just so you just to give a comparison point that's double the effect on your iq in the short term of getting stoned right so you would be better off sitting at your desk smoking a spliff and not being distracted than in terms of iq performance than sitting at your desk and and being distracted all the time right there was a a different study at carnegie mellon university they took 138 students and they uh split them into two equally sized groups and they were told to do an exam it was a real exam um and half of them it was normal exam conditions and half of them were told you can check your you, you can check your text messages while you're doing the exam um and the the um people who checked their text performed 20% worse than the people who who didn't right and if you think about it, that's that's a huge amount of our mental bandwidth that we are losing all the time right so also it's really important because if your screen time shows you spend 2 hours a day on your phone but that's spread throughout the day you're not just losing those 2 hours right you're losing a huge amount more in stolen focus lost focus mm-hmm. And as your mental bandwidth generates. Now that that process of being interrupted is accelerating. We we all know why. You don't need me to explain it, right? Um, so that's one example of how these factors are really invading and trashing our attention. Yeah, you know, and, and it's I mean, I, I um if if and when I do meditate, <laughs> I mean I mean I'm engaged <laughs> to a meditation teacher, but believe it or not, I don't do it anywhere near as much as I should. Um, I, I can see, so I'll what will usually happen is I'll, you know, I'll, I'll be going through the day and then I'll feel really jammed up. And, you know, my sympathetic nervous system is just alert and too much because I, I love my coffee, you know, and it just gets a little bit too, okay, I'll sit down and I'll, what well, I actually don't meditate. I'll just sit there and close my eyes and I can see all these things. The brain is just, you know, my brain is an, as an email inbox, it's got 10,000 emails in it and it's just going, God, you know, and, and, I think the worst thing about that is getting back to that point of deep thinking, the emails that were sent through three, four, five months ago that, you know, the bottom of the email list are really good thoughts that I perhaps want to write about or discuss with guests on the podcast. I'm never getting to them because I'm constantly putting more shit in my email inbox of just this, you know, the Snapchat and the Instagram and all that kind of thing. And, you know, I think coming back to that idea of the a different, different sorts of attention, you know, and, um, Matthew Walker wrote about that in, um, his book, why we sleep. And he said that, you know, when you dream or when you're just mind wandering, as you were talking about, it's, it's like your brain is performing a backwards Google search. That was his, his approach to it. And it's putting, you know, the salmon that you saw today with like a deep trauma and putting them together in a dream and, you know, all that kind of thing. But, um, perhaps maybe if you could speak to us on, on the different types of attention, because I think most of us, think of it in terms of um, what, you know, that kind of spotlight, that very specific focused attention. So this is one of the things that most surprised me in what I learned 
Um, and actually, of all the things I learned, that was it's one of the things that's been most personally mm. revelatory, revelatory for me. Um, so as you know, I went to this to go completely off the internet for three months and to have no smartphone. I went to a place called Province Town, which is a um, <laughs> kind of funny place. It's a uh, it's a little town at the tip of Cape Cod. Um, so it's basically on a sort of sandbar that juts into the Atlantic Ocean. And it used to be a sort of working class. It's actually the pl- first place where the pilgrims landed, but they, they didn't like it. So they went on to Plymouth Rock and people in Provincetown <laughs> are still pissed off that they, they don't get the credit for being the first place the pilgrims landed, but there <laughs> is. Um, but and it used to be this sort of working class Portuguese place with a lot of working class Portuguese immigrants who were fishermen. And then it became a sort of artistic colony. And now it's a sort of uh, gay town. And uh, so <laughs> to give you a sense of what it's like, there is more than one person who lives in Provincetown whose full-time job is to dress as Ursula from The Little Mermaid, right? And, <laughs> really? uh, and sing funny. songs about cunnilingus. It's very impressive. <laughs> um, anyway, I decided to go there just because I thought, yeah, it's a small place. Uh, I can walk around it. You know, I, I, I need it just somewhere, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and so I went to Provincetown and um, lots of things happened in Provincetown and I learned a lot about myself and about attention that then made sense later when I interviewed all these experts. But for me, the most, one of the most revelatory things was it changed my understanding of what attention actually is and and a crucial component, which you're getting at. So when we think about attention, there's one dominant metaphor that we use and it's, um, okay. So it's, it comes from a man called William James, who was the kind of father of American psychology. So you picture like the Hollywood bowl, right? And you picture, I don't know, an Adele concert, right? I was just watching Adele last night, so it's in my mind. Uh, picture an Adele concert, right? And the crowd is bustling and, you're, you know, we're all like w- waiting. And, and then suddenly Adele walks on stage and everyone goes quiet and a light goes onto Adele and all of our attention spotlights onto one thing, Adele, mm. right? So that is what we generally think of as attention. It's your ability to narrow your focus narrow the stimuli you're exposed to onto one thing, right? To selectively attend to whatever occurs in your environment is the kind of fancy way of putting it, right? And that is an absolutely crucial form of attention. And that form of attention is really suffering now in the world, right? For for all sorts of reasons, some of which we've talked about and many which we haven't. So you've got this, 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 this belief. So when I went to Provincetown, I thought, oh, what I want is to be able to have more of that spotlight kind of attention. I want to be able to read more books, for example. And after a process we can talk about, that did indeed come back in Provincetown, right? That really did come back. I was amazed by how much um, strips of these constant switching and distraction, my, re- my attention came back to what it was like when I was a teenager. Mm. Um, I mean, I read War and Peace, like in like a very short period of time, for example. Um, But I also discovered something else, which at first I thought was a failing of mine. So I I didn't have a smartphone, but I brought with me an iPod, an old style iPod, which was so funny because I remember thinking, God, when when iPods first came along, they seemed so futuristic. In Provincetown, they looked like something I'd discovered like from the Ark or something. (laughs) But so I had that to listen to things. But I, I, and it's funny, I would, I had these noise cancelling headphones that I would listen to the uh, the iPod on. And every time I switched them on, it would say, searching for Johan's iPhone, searching for Johan's iPhone. And yeah. after about a minute, it would just go, connection cannot be made. And I was <laughs> like, oh, at first, that's how it felt. It was like, oh, what's going on here? But then, yeah. anyway, so I, I would, when I walked out, still for the first I think about a month I was in Provincetown, I would read a book and then I would put on my headphones and I would go and walk listening to audio books. And then I would bump into people. I would talk to them, but I was very much in kind of spotlight mode. Hmm. And then I started just going, just leaving the iPod at home and going for just really long walks, like literally like five hour long walks. You can walk basically straight down the beach in Provincetown to other towns. Um, And I found that on those walks, my mind was just incredibly fertile. I was just thinking of loads of ideas. I was more creative than I've been in, I think, many years, but probably my entire adult life. Um, And I kept writing down, oh, that would be a good book. That would be a good book. Why do this? Why do that? Um, And thinking and thinking and thinking. But then I would get back and be like, oh, that's not what you came here to do. You came here to focus more. And yet you're... 
but then I actually interviewed the leading expert later, obviously, after I left Provincetown, the leading experts in the world on the science of mind wandering. Mm. And I discovered really important, I learned really important things about that. There's this, this guy called Marcus Reichel, who's a, a professor at Washington School of Medicine in St. Louis in Missouri, who is one of the leading neuroscientists in the whole world, who made this big breakthrough. It's so funny, when he was a kid in a place called Aberdeen in Washington State, um, he used to, his, his teacher, a man called Mr. Smith, called in Marcus's parents and said, you know, your son's really got a problem. And it said, and he said, what? And he said, oh, he just, he, he's just mind wandering all the time. He just daydreaming. He just stares out the window, which of course we were taught in school. That's, this is where it comes from, right? Partly where it's an expression of these ideas and also a font of these ideas that, you know, oh, the worst thing you can do is just mind wander, just, just wander around, you know, let your mind wander freely. That we think of that as slacking. It's exactly how I thought about myself in Provincetown. Um, but actually in the, the 90s, Marcus, Professor Reichel, made this, this really big breakthrough. So he was, PET scans had just been invented, a new way of scanning the brain. Um, they were literally invented like outside his office, funny enough. Oh, wow. um, and he started to do research using them. And he was studying something else, something that didn't relate to mind wandering. But when he had people, so he had always been taught when he was at medical school that when you're not thinking about anything, consciously, your brain is just sort of inert. A bit like, you know, I'm not using my arm muscles now. I certainly use my arm muscles less than you do anyway, <laughs> but I'm certainly not, not using my arm muscles now. So my arm muscles are just inert. They're not doing anything, right? right? And it was thought your brain is like that, right? That you're, when you're not consciously doing something, it's just sort of inert. It's waiting to be activated. Mm -hmm. It gets people in these PET scans to scan them for various things. But he notices this really odd thing, which is when they're waiting for the experiment to begin, and they're not thinking about anything in particular, their brain is just as active as when they're consciously focusing. It's just active in a different way. And he notices that a particular part of the brain is in fact very active when you're not consciously thinking about anything. He named this part of the brain. It's called the default mode network. It's a really big breakthrough in how people think about neuroscience. But and this then led to, there's a big debate about, is that the part of the brain that's active when you're mind wandering? Some people think it is, some people think it isn't. But, but what this led to a, a real breakthrough in the science of, of mind wandering, mm -hmm. right? And I interviewed lots of experts about this in Montreal and in Canada and in York and England and other places. And, and they discovered really that there are three key forms of thinking that happen when you are mind wandering. The first is that you are making sense of the world, right? So if you think about um, when you read a book, if you read a book, um, you know, you, 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 um, you focus on the specific words, the specific, you know, thing you're reading, but inevitably uh, you pause and your mind wanders a little bit, right? It, 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 so you might read a paragraph and you go, oh, that reminds me of when I was a kid and this thing happened to me, or, oh, that's like my friend Joe, or, you know, your mind wanders a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, what they discovered is actually mind wandering, which is very different to switching tasks and come back to how the, the thing that R. Miller was describing. When you're mind wandering, you are making sense of what you're experiencing, right? You are, um, you know, you're, you're, you're connecting it with the past and the future. You're connecting with what you already know. You're thinking, oh, is this consistent? Is it, people listening to us now, their mind will be wandering a little bit. Thinking, well, well, hang on, does that fit with what Johan said before? Oh, isn't, his voice sounds a bit like my cousin Bob. You know, you're, the, there's a whole <laughs> range of things where your mind will be wandering. And it turns out that is how we make sense of, of the world, right? We relate it to other things. Um, so that's the second thing you do. You make connections, right? So you, first is you make, first thing that you do in mind wandering is you make sense of things. The second is you make connections. And the third is what they call mental time travel. A bit like Matthew Walker's very good phrase about, you know, Googling, you, 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 you know, you think about the past and most importantly, you anticipate the future, right? Most importantly, you anticipate the future. You think about what might happen next, right? So it turns out mind wandering is itself an absolutely crucial form of attention. Mm. It, it, it is one of the most important. It's where you're paying attention to the past, the future, and connections to other things that you know. Mm. If we take away space for mind wandering, you just understand much less of what's going on. You anticipate the future less well, so you're more anxious and brittle. There's a whole range of things that are absolutely that are essential that happen in mind wandering. And there was a really 
a moment that fell into place for me, I was talking to Marcus Reichel, the guy who'd made this, this breakthrough. And Marcus, when I interviewed him, had just turned 80 and he played in a symphony orchestra. He was an oboe player. And um, his favorite uh, piece of music was Dvorak's Ninth Symphony. Mm. And he just retired from the, sim- from the orchestra because he was 80. And, and I was th- he was talking a lot about the joy of playing in, a, in a, an orchestra. And I, I suddenly thought, oh, it's like, you know, because you've got in an orchestra, you've got whatever it is, your oboes, your woodwind, all, all the different things that are in an orchestra. Um, and they all come together to create this beautiful symphony, right? And I began to think, oh, in a way, thinking is like that, yeah. right? Yeah. You, you 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 need spotlight focus to be sure, you know, just like you need the woodwinds, but on its own, they can't play Dvorak's Ninth Symphony, right? You need all of these different instruments. And in the same way, you need a whole range of forms of attention. But what we've got, to extend this metaphor probably too far, <laughs> is it's like you, we've got a symphony playing Dvorak's Ninth, ninth uh, you know, it, we, we've got an orchestra playing Dvorak's Ninth Symphony, but it's like, Slipknot have charged the stage, some sort of heavy metal band, and they're standing at the front and they're just screaming, right? And no yeah. disrespect to Slipknot, my nephew will uh, chastise me if I diss them. Um, no disrespect to Slipknot, but it, it, what, we, what we're doing is we are neither mind wandering nor paying spotlight attention most mm. of the time. We're in this jammed up switching state all the time mm. where actually we cannot think clearly and it really fucks with our ability to think clearly. Mm. And that's why, um, that's why we, we need to cut down on the skimming and switching to free up the space for both spotlight focus and mind wandering. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I was wondering even what, you know, when I was reading that part, because, um, you know, when people started talking about the default mode network, you know, people started thinking, oh, have we now found neuroscientific evidence for what Freud was speaking about a hundred years ago in terms of the unconscious and all this kind of thing. And I thought, I'm not sure if there's still debate on that or whether that's conclusive, but um, one thing I remember reading about in, in, in Matthew Walker's book was that when you don't sleep, um, you know, that kind of st- that deep, that deep thinking stage three and four, it doesn't care whether you sleep or not. It's going to try to get that deep, even when that um, deep sleep, even when you're awake. So it's, you, you'll find yourself that you're hallucinating when you're standing around and um, you know, pe- people talk about it all the time and they, you know, feel like they're hallucinating or that kind of thing. And I wonder that when that happens, the brain's just doing what it needs to because it's evolved for so many years for survival purposes that not only is this all happening at the same time, but it's also hallucinating and, you know, you can just imagine how people would come to a therapist and say, I think I'm going crazy when in actual fact, it's just, we just need to kind of detach, you know, which is obviously easier said than done. But this is, this is well, and the whole the society and culture militate against us doing that, but the, no, you're absolutely right. This is one of the sleep is one of the 12 causes mm. that um, of our attention crisis that I write about or our collapsing levels of sleep that I write about in, in style and focus. You're totally right. The figures on this are staggering. Only 15% of us wake up feeling refreshed. And that really came home to me in Provincetown where obviously I went to sleep. I had no devices. I didn't look at them before I went to bed. Um, I actually went to sleep when it got dark, which I don't think I've done since I was a child. Yeah. Um, in fact, I definitely haven't done since I was a child. Um, and, and I just slept as long as I wanted, which is, I know is an incredible luxury. And we need to talk about how we can change our society and culture so more people can do this. But I remember about three weeks in, I remember waking up and walking in my box of shorts to, this, to the kitchen in the place I'd rented and standing in front of the kettle and, and thinking to myself, I, I feel really strange. What do I feel? And I was standing there, and, I, and it sounds really stupid, but I, I was thinking, oh, I'm not tired. <laughs> like, I'm, I feel really refreshed. Yeah. I don't need this coffee. And it was a really stra- I, I don't, I don't remember ever feeling that as an adult until I went to Provincetown. Literally never, right? Mm. And, and I'm not alone, right? So 40% of Americans sleep less than seven hours a night. Incredibly, 23% of British people sleep on average five hours a night, which is devastating, right? And this is, this is very new. Mm. So there's good research on this. Since 1942, uh, the average adult sleeps an hour less a day. Since in the last century, since the 1920s, children have lost 80 minutes of sleep a day. And we know the effects on this, on attention. So I interviewed 
one of the leading experts in the world. I'm, I'm interviewed lots of experts on sleep, but I interviewed a particular person who made a series of really important breakthroughs on this, a man named Dr. Charles Seisler, who is at Harvard Medical School now. And Charles, in Dr. Seisler, in 1981, was doing this research that led him to make all these breakthroughs. So he was studying something that had nothing to do with sleep. He was studying um, the particular time of day the body releases a certain hormone. It's not relevant what it was. Mm. Uh, but to, to study this, he had to keep people awake. So he's in a lab in Boston, and he had to really keep people awake for long periods of time to study the release of this, this hormone. And so to keep people awake, he would do they would do all sorts of like games, you know, um, and he had to you know, study them in various ways. So for example, he would show them a picture of a car and they'd take the picture away and he'd say, what color was the car I just showed you? Or, you know, what make of car was it? And he was really struck that if you kept people awake, not that long, their attention, their ability to focus fell off a cliff. So things that you would normally recall in a fraction of a second would start to take eight, nine, 12 seconds. Wow. He discovered... If you keep people awake for 19 hours, that doesn't feel very long, right? Mm. If you stay awake for 19 hours, your attention deteriorates to the same level as it would as if you were legally drunk, mm. right? Yeah. So he begins to research this. Again, he, it's a bit like what uh, Marcus Reichel had been told about mind wandering. When, when Charles was at, at medical school, he was told that when you're sleeping, you're just switched off. It's just a passive state. It's like he would want to study people who are just switched off, right? Yeah. Actually, he discovered that... Uh, him and a whole range of other people made a series of really huge breakthroughs on, on sleep. And, and one of the most striking in terms of attention was um, he, he, he pioneered this technique. It's very simple. You put people in a machine, basically, and it can do two things. It can track what their eyes are looking at, and it can track what's happening in their brain. And what he discovered was when you're tired, you experience what are called attentional blinks, where you can literally be looking at something but your brain is not at all processing what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. And he, he actually discovered this phenomenon called local sleep, which is where you are awake, but parts of your brain have literally gone to sleep. It's called local sleep because it's local to one part of the brain. So, so he's looking at people and their eyes are open and they're looking at something, but they are not processing it. And the part of the brain that is relevant to it is literally asleep, right? Now, lots of us are experiencing that, um, a lot of the time. I mean, if you look at um, there's one of the biggest, most one of the most rapidly rising forms of death is as a result of distracted driving. There's a guy called Dr. David Shaler at the University of Utah. He's a cognitive neuroscientist who's done a huge amount of research on this. Um, you, again, you can study it in driving simulators. Um, when you're tired, you're as bad at driving as if you were drunk, right? Um, and you don't have to be that tired. We think of it. And the other thing, uh, one of the one of the many other things. Dr. Seisler discovered is like, so a lot of people will hear that and think, oh, well, I don't stay awake. I don't pull all nighters. Right. But even if you just go for sit with six hours sleep a night for a cup for a couple of weeks, you're at your, you will find yourself at the level you would be as if you were pulling an all nighter. Right. Mm. Um, so this is really significant. Uh, Dr. Professor Roxanne Prashad, who's at the university of Minneapolis, so where I interviewed her talked about how, um, when you're resting, you're repairing. When you're sleeping, your body is repairing. This is not a passive process. Lots of very active things are happening when you're asleep. So one is your cerebral spruce, sorry, cerebral, um, cerebral spinal fluid channels um, open up. So a sort of watery fluid washes through them essentially a kind of positive brainwashing happens <laughs> where your brain cleans itself. It cleans away all the metabolic waste that builds up during the day and takes it down to your liver and, and flushes it away. So you've got, your brain is repairing, cleaning. One uh, sleep expert has put it, it's a bit like uh, you can either have a house party or you can clean your house, but you can't do it at the same time. Nice. In the same way, your body can either clean itself or it can be awake and going around doing stuff, but it can't do both at the same time. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and when you don't sleep, your body interprets that as an emergency. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, of course, humans evolved to stay awake. How would we survive 
hurricanes or even having children if we couldn't go without sleep. But when you go without sleep, your body interprets it as an emergency and it shuts down lots of other things, right? It makes you crave more junk food. It makes you want more glucose for fast release of energy. It raises your blood pressure. It does all sorts of things. Um, and it shuts down, of course, the parts of attention about mind wandering. It's just like, okay, what's the immediate task? What's the immediate task? But, but, but um, if that becomes a protracted state, that really damages your ability to, to think clearly. And again, I think this comes back to what we were saying right at the start. And, and Dr. Seisler made this connection. Why are we sleeping so much less? Mm. It's because of this sense of the world accelerating and this kind of growth machine. Dr. Seisler said to me, mm. imagine if tomorrow um, everyone slept the amount of sleep they actually should have, right? that would cause a huge economic crisis because they'd be shopping two hours less a day. They'd be absorbing advertising yeah. two hours less a day. So you can see how the machine in which we live is militating against actually fairly basic forms of protection and focus. And this was really clear to me when I, mm. having had such a great experience in Provincetown and I came back and then just, it all went to shit really quickly. So, and then I did, was able to build in certain things I could do in my life, but, that I think we live in this really interesting gap between what we know we should do and what we feel we can do, right? And there's and there are very practical things we can do to deal with that. Can I give you an example mm -hmm. of a really practical thing that everyone in Australia should be fighting for? So in France, in 2016, the government noticed there'd been this big increase, and there was a lot of political pressure, uh, there'd been this big increase in what they call le burnout, which you don't need me to translate. Very French. And, <laughs> but, <laughs> exactly. Uh, exactly. Uh, the, um, you know, and, and, and a particular problem they had was that they set up this, they got this guy called Bruno Metling, who's the head of Orange, one of their big telecoms companies, to do research on this. And what he discovered is a third of people, in a third of French people, a staggering number, felt they could never unplug or turn their phones off in case their boss messaged them, right? Yeah. That, you know, people felt they were, I mean, when I was a child, the only people who were on call were the prime minister and doctors, mm. right? Now, most workers are basically on call most of the time, mm. right? And a lot of people feel they can't, you know, unplug and spend time with their children or read a book in case their boss messages them and they don't see it, right? So Bruno Metling proposed a change to the law which is called the right to disconnect, which was then introduced into French law. It's very simple. You have a right to legally defined work hours and you have a right to not have to check your email or answer work messages outside those legally defined work hours, right? So it was to create a situation where we were not all constantly doing unpaid overtime. Mm -hmm. um, and this change was introduced. I spoke to a lot of people about it in Paris. Um, it's having an effect. I mean, the... There's a guy, for example, who worked for rent -a kill You know, rent -a kill got fined 70,000 euros because they complained that he hadn't answered his email at work hours, right? And tried to punish him. And he was like, screw this and sued them and got quite a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's a very practical thing. Because to me, it comes back to cruel optimism. Mm. There's a point saying to people, you know, life would be so much better if you slept for two hours more a night, right? So it's like going up to a starving person and going... It looked like me going up to a really hungry homeless person and going, you know, you would feel so much better if you went to the Ritz and just have yeah. a really good meal. And think, <laughs> That's well, right. fuck you. Of course yeah. I fucking would. I know that. That's I can't right. fucking do that, right? So there's no point giving people these sweet self-help bromides if we don't give people very practical collective solutions for how we get to the situation where they can actually do that, mm. right? But there are practical solutions where we can do that. France is not you know, a hypothetical science fiction country, France exists, right? They did it in France. Um, we can do these things, right? There was a big collective struggle to introduce the weekend. Australia, again, first country in the world that got there, right? Why did that happen? Because ordinary Australian workers banded together. So we're not going to fucking work seven days a week. We're not going to fucking work six days a week. And I'm mm. sure they said the word fucking a lot. So <laughs> Aussies. Absolutely. Uh, we, we fucking insist that we will do a maximum of five days a week. And they did it because they banded together they had collective power through labor unions uh, and they fought like hell for it and they didn't give up and it took quite a long time, mm. but they got there. So, and the weekend for a century, it's been eroded now, but the weekend for a century gave people a, um, 
guaranteed amount of downtime in which to live, right? That work didn't invade every aspect of their lives. So mm. I think we've got to be looking at these practical solutions like that. But I mean, even what you were saying to, uh, towards the end of, of the book again with, you know, um, there was that CEO who introduced a four day working week. And I think, you know, that there's this um, almost like a spiritual idea, you know, that I can hear kind of coming through what we're talking about here is yin, both yin and yang exist, you know, and if you're just doing all the time without sleeping and mind wandering or going for a walk without a, an iPod or whatever it is, you know, if you're just working all the time, I think even to me, what I hear is, you know, as a counselor and a psych to be is, you know, when someone comes to me and they say, Oh, you know, I can't find my purpose or whatever it is, you know, maybe some of that is to do with the fact that we now live in a world where you, you can't even get the opportunity to miss working. You know, it's just like, you, you don't go away on a weekend and then you have a chat with your coworkers and go, Oh, what was your weekend? Like, because we know all the time because we're seeing everything on social media all the time you know, having that balance of, oh, okay, I've, I had a really good fun weekend and now I'm actually really excited to get stuck into this book or this report or whatever it is. None of that is around anymore, you know, and it's um, it's that real imbalance that I just feel it's kind of like that idea it's pervading this, this interview. I think you're totally right. I think that's a really good way of putting it, Tom, and I think there was, it was a real revelation to me. So that company you talked about that you alluded to in New mm. Zealand, I went to, to, to their offices, I went to interview the CEO in, in Auckland and they went to their offices in Rotorua and it was really fascinating. So Andrew Barnes, so the company is called Perpetual Guardian. They do wills and trusts. They're about 240 staff members. And Andrew, um, Andrew who runs it, Andrew Barnes, you know, in 1987, he worked in the city of London, the financial sector in London. And he was part of this explosion at the time. So there was this big deregulation of the financial sector in London. It was called the Big Bang. And so, you know, this kind of swaggering, you know, ultra macho, you picture men in suits screaming at each yeah. other across the stock exchange floor. He was a big part of that, right? And in that world, when he was in his 20s, you know, you were an absolute wimp if you, you know, weren't at your desk at 7.30 and you were a, a, a complete pussy if you left before 7 30 p.m. That's the language they would use, not me. Yeah. Um, and to be clear. And <laughs> um, and and so for you know, half the year, Andrew just never saw the sun, right? He didn't see his children, right? Mm. He he and he would I remember him talking about how he would miss the sunlight on his face. He was just working constantly and in this ultra macho aggressive world. And eventually he quit. He went to Australia and New Zealand and did very well. This lesson of that that time when he had obsessively overworked, it really damaged his relationship with his children. He said he had to rebuild that when they were adults. Um, really haunted him. And one day in in 2018, he um, or tw sorry 2016, he was on a plane, and he was reading a business magazine, and it struck him. So he read this 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 piece that piece of research that had discovered that the average worker only focuses on their actual job three hours a day. So they're at their desk. I mean, this is pre-plague times. They're at their desk. Their life is passing them by. They're not seeing their kids. They're not doing the things they love. But they're also not actually doing their job for most mm -hmm. of the time they're there, right? He was really struck by that. It reminded him of when he'd been a sort of prisoner of work. Um, and he did some sort of back-of-the-envelope calculations. We figured out, you know, if I said to all my workers that you only have to work four days a week and I'll pay you the same amount. And in return, they actually focused on their job just for 45 minutes more a day. So they had, they were more rested, they were more refreshed. And in return, you know, as a result of that, they, they worked for concentrated 45 minutes more a day, actually just 45 minutes more a day would make up for the day they lost. Right. So he decided to try this, to do this as an experiment. Uh, and he does this conference call with the whole company. His head of HR literally fell over. Uh, and he says, I'm going to pay everyone four days a week. Uh, I'm going to pay everyone the same amount of five days a week for four days a week. Uh, in return, I believe that you will produce as much or more because you'll be better rested. You can spend time with your kids, do whatever you want. Uh, let's try it for three months. And if at the end of those three months, you know, the company's doing okay, we'll carry on. And I remember speaking to the, I interviewed all the people who worked at their office in Rotorua, which is a, a town in New Zealand that smells weirdly of farts. Um, and um, really? very nice, other than 
horrible fucking sulfur smell in that town. But anyway, the uh, very nice in every other respect. No disrespect to people in who are listening, but you should move. Um, the, um, but the stuff were really interesting. And at first, they had been quite skeptical. They were like, well, how is this going to work, right? Um, but actually, they talked about what they did. So Amber, who worked there, talked about she had a daughter. She just took out of school, uh, took out of daycare and spent a day playing with her. Um, one of the guys who worked there was his name, Ro- Ross. Um, Russ, Russell. Uh, he uh, just did DIY. One of them just kind of had long barbs, you know, like just chilled out. Yeah. And, and, and Gemma, Gemma Mills, who worked there, said to me, you know, she realized that if you're going five days a week all the time, you, your brain never switches off. It's mm. always running a bit on that. Um, and anyway, what they found was they were more productive. This was studied by Dr. Helen Delaney at the University of Auckland Business School. Uh, what they found is um, 35% increase in productivity, huge fall in the amount of time they looked at social media, 15% fall in stress. And most people, including the people who were quite skeptical at the start, like the heads of HR, believe that they they achieved more in four days than they did in five mm. and this is something you see mm. pretty much everywhere that moves to a four-day week so microsoft in japan did it they had a 40 percent increase in productivity toyota in gothenburg in sweden moved to a six-hour day instead of an eight-hour day saying pay they found uh, they had a 25 percent increase in profits after they did that wow. and i interviewed a guy called professor jeffrey pfeffer at stanford university who um is a sort of expert on organizational management. And he said to me, well, I was sort of asking all these technical, why does it work? What, what does it mean? They just said, ask any sports fan, do you want your team to go on the pitch when they're exhausted? Mm. Obviously not. Well, exactly the same goes for all workers. I was like, oh yeah, that's a really obvious point, right? Yep. <laughs> we, 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 we totally get in every other sphere. So to me, that's an incredible advance. It's a sort of cost-free advance actually, because... He, yeah, he, even so. if it didn't mean that you produced more in four days than you did in five, it would still be worth doing because life is not all about work. But actually, it's a cost free. The only reason I feel anxious about conveying that story, why I think it's slightly misleading, um, to, to just leave it there, is so Andrew Barnes, who did this, is an extremely admirable man and an unusually enlightened employer. My worry is people hear that story and they think, oh, I wish my boss would do that. Most bosses are never going to be as enlightened as Andrew. Now, Andrew's doing a great job of trying to persuade other bosses this will benefit them and all credit to him. But actually, most bosses will only move to a four-day week if we make them, in the same way that the bosses did not hand down the weekend in Australia in the 1880s or the 1890s. Um, They did it because they were made to, because their workers were organized and made them do it. And one of the reasons I think we're having this so many problems with work and work making us miserable is, you know, we disbanded labor unions to a large degree. This has happened. It's happened slightly less in Australia than a lot of other countries, but it's still happened to a significant degree in Australia. You know, rich people are constantly well-organized and defend their interests all the time. I guarantee you someone is defending Elon Musk's interests right now mm-hmm. and any well, a second of the day anyone's listening to this podcast there will not just be one person doing that but many hundreds if not yeah. thousands right so rich people band together into groups called corporations and defend their interests all the time there used to be groups that defended the interests of working class people and middle class people and if you don't live off capital you're working class right um if you don't live off you know renting out things to people or whatever yeah um and we, if they're organized and we aren't, well, the society is going to work in their interests, not ours, right? As you, in fact, see when you look around you, it's why there's so much income inequality and why workers get fucked over so much. Um, we need to organize. You know, it becomes another part of just organizing. Now, there will be some enlightened bosses who see the case that Andrew's making. Obviously, I hope that happens lots, but, but most of it has to come from fighting. But yeah, yeah it, a society of people who are underslept, overworked, eat the wrong food. We can talk about that if you like. Constantly switching between tasks, a whole, uh, invaded, uh, constantly exposed to technologies that are designed to invade their attention and hold them as long as possible. Uh, and a whole range of other things I write about in the book, Stolen Focus. Those are going to be societies where people can't pay attention mm. uh, or certainly not to the same degree as they, they should and should be able to. And that is not their fault. That is the fault of these forces that are stealing their focus. 
Mm, yeah, and, and I hope that, um, you know, when people read this book, they are really able to kind of lift that shame that's, you know, passively jammed down their throats. It's me. I've got a problem. I can't focus. I mean, how many of us say, oh, I can't meditate? It's like, well, we live in a world that it's very, very difficult to meditate. Now, Johan. It's like trying to meditate on the fucking battlefield at the Somme, right? Like that, I mean, that'd be weird. Like a top analogy, but or it's like trying to meditate in the middle of a heavy metal concert, right? Yes. That's not the time when you're going to be able to go into your meditation, right? Totally. Um, and I do think it comes back to the, the obesity analogy really helps, right? Mm -hmm. So if you look at a beach, a picture of a beach in Sydney or, uh, you know, anywhere in, in the Western world in 1970, Every single person is what we would call slim or buff. Everyone. There are no one. There's nobody who is what we would call fat, right? And as we know, and, and that was representative of the wider society, there was almost no obesity in 1970, which is not so long ago, right? Mm. That's My parents were, I think, older than I am now in 1970, right? Or maybe, no, they're probably about the same age. Um, that's... That's very recent, right? And as we know, there has been an explosion in obesity that happened for deep structural systemic reasons. Our food supply changed from yeah. fresh, nutritious food to processed or ultra processed food that is pumped full of um, synthetic dyes and all sorts of things that screw us up. Um, and we built societies that we built cities that it's very hard to walk or bike around, mm. right? So it's very hard to actually be physically active. And obesity exploded. And how did we respond? Overwhelmingly, the diet industry trained us to respond by blaming and shaming ourselves mm. by saying, "Oh, you know, I'm not good enough. I'm and I've been there. I'm not lazy. You know, I'm lazy. I, 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 I'm indulgent. I'm greedy." And it's been a disaster, right? Mm. Has that solved our problem? No. Every year we do that more and every year the obesity crisis gets worse. 19 out of every 20 people who lose a significant amount of weight on a diet regain it within one to five years mm. because we haven't changed the environment, right? You know, you can, you, you, some people can run up a down escalator, but most people can't, right? Um, if back in 1970 or in the years that followed when the obesity crisis began, if instead of torturing and blaming ourselves, we had actually um, organized, we'd taken all that energy we put into trying to starve ourselves, we'd put that into pressuring to retain an affordable nutritious food supply and retaining cities that it's possible to walk and bike around, we wouldn't have an obesity crisis now, or certainly it'd be vastly less, as you see when you look at the societies that did that, like Amsterdam, right? Where they've got vastly less obesity precisely because they had that fight, right? Mm -hmm. Now, my worry is we're responding to our attention crisis with digital diet books, right? Now, there's lots of advice in my book for what individuals personally can do. I'm in favor of all those things. I do all those things. They will significantly help you. But I'm also in favor of being honest. There's a limit to how far that will take you, right? And for the other, to the next layer up, we got to deal with the, we've got to take on the factors and the forces that are stealing our attention. Mm -hmm. We've got to do both, right? And it's absolutely achievable. And we've got to do it pretty fucking quick yes. because this yes. crisis is getting worse, right? Yeah. Oh no, absolutely. And look, I mean, I would love to sit here for another <laughs> good couple of hours because I believe it or not, I actually didn't ask you any of these questions because we were, we're, <laughs> we were in flow. If I could very quickly just segue that and if you could just give us a two minute rundown, because it was one of the parts that I love reading mostly. I love Mahali and I think the idea of a flow state where time ceases to exist and all that really important points. So could you just touch on the flow state for us? Yes, I'll try to do it in two minutes. Yes. Um, it's a good discipline for me. Um, so when I was in Provincetown and uh, I initially arrived and I don't have all these uh, things that are invading my attention, um, I initially had this sort of haze of decompression and I felt much better, but I was still sort of skimming the things I read. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't totally able to slow down. Then I, then I sort of gradually slowed down. I experienced this sense of bliss and my attention coming back. And then I had a really nasty crash, right? I was like, I was looking at people, looking at their phones, and instead of being like, oh, you fools, you know, you're, you're, I was like, fucking give me that phone, right? I was, like, I was desperately craving the rewards that you get from social media, right? Yeah. I had been trained to crave the sort of thin, insistent signals that we get from these things. Um, 
And so then I was like, I realized, oh, when you, when you set aside these forms of distraction, you actually create a vacuum, right? Which you need to fill with meaning and with more meaningful things, right? You, you clear this space, but clearing the space is not enough. You then need to fill it. And I remembered I had actually, I'd actually studied this when I was a student, that, and I then went to interview the man who discovered it. Sadly, just died. Professor Mahali Cheek sent me oh, high. Oh, I didn't um, know that. Yeah. No, he died about three weeks ago. Oh, damn. Uh, gutted. Wow. Yeah, he was very unwell when I interviewed him. You could oh. tell. But um, so um, he he had made this incredible breakthrough in the 1960s. So he was the first person to identify what are called flow states, which basically almost everyone listening will have experienced a flow state. It's when you're doing something that's really meaningful to you. Usually it's when you're doing something at the edge of your abilities, when you're doing something that you sort of know how to do, but you're pushing it a bit. Um, it's a moment when time seems to fall away, when you, seem com- when you feel completely absorbed in the task you're doing. As one rock climber put it, it's when you feel like you are the rock you're climbing, mm. right? You lose that sense of self-consciousness. For me, it comes when I'm writing or sometimes when I'm talking about the things I've written. Mm. Um, and flow states are moments when humans feel best, right? They're really essential moments for healthy human psychology. And Mahali had shown that flow states are really fragile. And the thing that will most fuck them is um, distraction. If, you are, if you're interrupted, to get into a flow state, you have to narrow down to one goal. I want to learn the guitar. I want to read this book. I want to set up this business, whatever it is. You narrow your focus down and, uh, and you push your ability, right? You push at the edge of your ability. Um, but if you can't narrow your focus down, you, you just don't get to get into flow states, right? Or you get them much less. They're interrupted. Um, and I think one of the crises we're facing is we're facing a real crisis of flow states, right? Mm. Flow states are where people find their deepest sense of satisfaction and meaning. And when, you, when you're chronically deprived of flow, you can sense something isn't right. Mm. You know, you, you sort of begin to sense, you you become a sort of stump of what you might have been. Um, so there are ways we can get back into flow. And the great thing about flow is it's a form of focus that we can drill down into that actually feels effortless. When you're in a flow state, it doesn't feel like, it's not like, oh, I've got to study this book to memorize it for a test. It becomes a deep form of focus that flows very, it's like a gusher of flow that exists inside all of us. And we need to learn where to drill to get that gusher of flow. But to do it, you have to, mm. you have to separate yourself from distractions. You have to push at the edge of your abilities. Um, yeah. So that's, I don't know if that was, I think it was probably longer than two minutes. So sorry. <laughs> no, but it, it's just great. Uh, funnily enough, I actually get it when, um, when I'm in a podcast and I can almost feel myself just being outside of myself. And I feel like I, I become an antenna and I'm just kind of sitting here and it's not Tom who's having a conversation with someone, but I'm just watching it. And it's just, it's a very, it's a very euphoric feeling, you know? Um, so yeah, just, just a really important point. I think that um, we need to touch on in the, in the show, but mate, it's so, so great to catch up again. Thanks so much for Great. the show. Excellent. Let's do it in Melbourne next time when the plague yeah. is over. Yeah. <laughs> we can sing We'll Meet Again. That'll Absolutely. Be great. Uh, yeah. I really enjoyed this. And I meant to say, or oh, my publishers will tase me. Um, the book is out on um, January the 6th in Australia. And uh, you can get it from, uh, you can find out more information about the book or the audio book at stolenfocusbook.com. Um, you can also see. Um, you can listen to audio of interviews with lots of the people we've talked about, like including Mahali right. Cheek sent me hi. Uh, you have no idea how long it took me to memorize how to say I was going to say. Name. Nice. And the, uh, I noticed you just said Mahali, which is <laughs> I just went for the first but name. <laughs> that first smart strategy. Uh, and you can, um, yeah. And the book is available from all good Australian booksellers, uh, who I like, uh, cause Australia has lots of lovely bookshops. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, mate, well, I'll definitely hold you that to that, um, interview number. Right. That'd be good. Cool guys. Uh, thanks so much for listening and we'll speak to you next time. Bye.